if you are in the United States. My name is Alessio Giovene, and today I am the moderator of the event A Conversation is a Creation, organized by the site La Terza Via. Our kind guests are Professor Luigi Fontanella from Storybrook University, New York, and Professor Giorgio Mobili from California State University in Fresno, presenting today one of the latest poetry books by Luigi Fontanella, L'Adolescenza e la Notte, winner of the Pascoli Prize and of the Viareggio Jury Prize, and now translated into English by Giorgio Mobili. Before to introduce our guests, I'd like to speak about La Terza Via, the website organizing the lecture today. I think the best way to understand the purpose of the site is to read the words of the founder, Patrizia Trimbori. La Terza Via wants to be part of a wider cultural horizon, looking for the true values of a culture and gathering different areas of knowledge. Here, the gaze is for creatures seeking the light in the eyes of others, like cold water in our times, or simply is the pleasure to comprehend something unlimited. In other words, La Terza Via is a non-profit organization born to spread Italian culture in Italy and all around the world. In a few months, Patrizia has planned conferences with notable figures of Italian culture, for instance, with the philosopher Massimo Cacciari and the poet Gian Piero Neri. And now she's arranging new events, for example, with the writer Cla Cla Claudio Magris and the oncologist Marco Venturino. But now I'm glad to introduce our guest. Luigi Fontanella, the author of the poetry book L'Adolescenza e la Notte, is a poet, critic, translator, playwright, and novelist. After graduating from La Sapienza University in Rome, where he was a student of the very famous critic Giacomo De Benedetti, he obtained a PhD in Roman languages and literature at Harvard. He taught at Columbia, at Princeton, where he was a Fulbright Fellow at a Wesley College. Currently, Fontanella is Professor Emeritus of Italian Language and Literature at Stony Brook University. During the 80s, um, he was a cultural correspondent for RAI, the Italian National Broadcasting Company. He is also the founder and the president of IPA, Italian Poetry in America, senior editor for the Italian publishing house Olski of Gradiva, an international journal of Italian poetry, and the chief editor of Gradiva Publication. During his career, he has published several poetry collections, essays, articles, volumes of literary criticism, and works of fiction, winning several awards. Moreover, he is the author of screenplays, translations, and theatrical works. In 2005, he was appointed knight by the President of the Republic, Carlo Zeglio Ciampi. The bibliography of Fontanella is very vast. It includes more than 30 works, excluding the article, and likewise, a sizable scholarship has grown about his works. Among his recent books, uh, I would recall the poetry anthologies L'Azzurra Memoria, winner of the Città di Marineo Prize and the Laurentum Prize, Berthgang, Prata Prize and the Monazzi Prize, Disunita Ombra, Frascati Prize, L'Adolescenza e la Notte, the Pasco in Viareggio Jury Prize, tra yet translated into French and German and now by Giorgio into English, and Montestella published last year. As a novelist and a critic, notable are the fiction books Controfigura and Il Dio di New York, the essays Pasolini, Rileggia Pasolini, translated into different languages, Migrating Words, and the preface to uh, La Coscienza di Zeno, published by Giunti. Most recently, he has published the free act plays Tre Passi nel Desiderio. Mm. Giorgio Mobili is a translator, poet, and critic. He has a PhD in comparative literature from Washington University, St. Louis, Missouri, and currently teaches at California State University in Fresno. He is the author of several essays on postmodernism and of the book Heritable Bodies and Postmodern Subjects in Pinchon, Puy, and Volponi. As a poet, he is a published five collection. The last one is uh, Dimenticare un Hotel, 
and has been included in the bilingual anthology Poets of Italian Diaspora. After the publication of his uh, first Spanish book, Ultima Salida Ventura, he has translated into Italian the Brazilian poet Narla Matos, the American poet Christopher Mary, and the Sicilian poets Ennio Moltedo and Carmen Berenguer. Now, before to give the floor to Fontanella and Mobili, I would like to introduce with the, the book we discussed today. La Adolescenza La Notte is a poetry book, winner of two prizes, as I said before. It was published by the Italian publishing house Passi in 2015, and now once translated by Mobili by the American publishing house Fomite. The collection, divided into two sections, Adolescence and Night, revisits some themes on which Fontanella has been carrying out uh, his meditation for years. Maybe the most evident is a sort of Proustiana uh, Recherche du Temps Perdu, but there are also many other interesting themes. Thank you for listening. I wish you an enjoyable conference and give the floor to Luigi and Giorgio. Thank you. Thank you very much. I guess that uh, I think that maybe before I give the word to Giorgio, who will uh, guide this dialogue, I feel the duty and the pleasure to acknowledge the publishing house, uh, in particularly in the persons of Mark Estrin and Donna, who accepted to publish my book. And now I have the book in, uh, with me right now. And along with um, Mark and Donna, I feel the duty to um, acknowledge the beautiful initiative by the Terza Via, a beautiful, brilliant idea, idea by Patrizia Trimboli, whom I know for a long time now. And I would like to express my gratitude to Alessio and Milena, who have been helping uh, along with Andrea to make this um, event possible. Allow me also to say hello to some friends who are following this event in Italy, in particular Professor Giuseppe Nicoletti, um, Francesco Capaldo and many friends in Florence and in Rome. And speaking of Rome, I would like to say hello to my daughter, Emma Fontanella, who is a wonderful master chef patisserie, and her companion, Edoardo Santelli. Um, and I would like to say hello also to my brother, Gualberto, my sister in Padua, Maria Rosaria, and Angela in Rome. Thank you so much, all of you. And I would like to give my word now to uh, Giorgio, who will be the link in somehow of this discussion. Thank you, Giorgio. All right, can you guys hear me all right? Can you hear me? Yeah, a little bit, uh, if you can a little bit uh, uh, increase the volume, just a little bit, it will be better. <clears throat> How about now? Yes, yes. Better? All yes. right. All right, Luigi, uh, I just wanted to start off with a general question about your poetry. Um, if you could briefly describe your craft as a poet, how do you, how do you come across a poem? How does a poem present itself to you? How does it take shape on the page? Because I know you put a lot of uh, stock in the uh, chance, right? So can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yes, it's a very complex question. I would say that in general, there are two, um, two moments. Uh, one, I would, like, I would like to call it a reaction, reaction to something that I see or something that's happening in the society or uh, some, even an object, for example. So the first uh, impulse to write a poem is a reaction to something that could be uh, realistic, political, or sentimental, or just an image or an object. But I have to add also to this first um, aspect, 
a second, but not secondary, a second aspect, which is the, the activity uh, related to what in French is called the misomay, uh, half sleep in English, uh, which, which for me is a very important source. It's a very important um, source of inspiration. Uh, I try to be synthesized in this way. Uh, I have um, near my bed a notebook. Uh, sometimes I also have uh, a tape recorder, very small, very, very little. And during the, my sleep or half sleep, if you wish, sometimes there are words that come out or just uh, half sentences or just images. And I try to capture this moment by either writing very rapidly on this notebook or just saying some words. And this very inf informal material is the first basis for me to write a poem. Because when I get up in the morning, uh, I try to recollect these sparse notes, these fragments, and that's the beginning of a poem. That's the very, very beginning of the birth of a poem. Um, probably this technique, if I can call technique, this methodology is a result of my great love of, uh, the, of surrealism, the, the avant-garde, the historical avant-garde of surrealism, which I studied in depth. And I published two books on this uh, subject. Um, since I was a student at um, La Sapienza in Rome, I was a student of Giacomo de Benedetti, who loved very much Proust, uh, Svevo, and uh, these are writers of Tozzi, these are uh, Pirandello, these are writers that I studied very, very much in depth at the University of Rome under the guidance of Giacomo de Benedetti. And then I um, went even more in depth when I came to Princeton as a Fulbright Fellow because of the idea to come to Princeton where I was accepted as a Fulbright Fellow was to study, in fact, the presence of surrealism both in art and in literature in American 20th century culture. So in a way, this area I'm synthesizing now, of course, where ex mm, extremely important sources to which I have uh, been affiliated and uh, doing my research, both in terms of criticism and in terms of uh, literary creativity. So you, you Perhaps we could read a poem. We can alternate each segment yeah. with uh, at least one one or two poems. I'll point out that you you sort of rely on uh, on automatic writing a little bit to some uh, extent. Yes, yes, and no. Yes, in the sense of the first phase, it is yes. I try to be as much as I can free in the first phase of writing. Uh, there are two phases. The first the first phase is. Uh, it's totally open, it's almost horizontal. There is no limit, no condition, no whatsoever break or stylistic condition. On, only in the second phase when I revise the text, then of course the poem takes a shape and articulates in a more, uh, uh, should I say, plausible, and although I don't believe much in plausibility, I believe more in um, in uh, sudden uh, revelations. Sudden, to me, language is not a communication. Uh, as um, Lucien Goldman said one time in his beautiful book, uh, language is first of all not a communication, but is a revelation of something, and it is precisely this revelation that poetry is in charge to develop and to show the others. Right. Uh, I 
wanted to ask you a question, and then uh, as you answer that question, we can read a poem by way of the, you know, an example. Um, you dedicated this book to French filmmaker François Truffaut, and then in one of the most haunting poems, uh, to my mind, you, you quote the film Vertigo by Alfred Hitchcock. And in the book, you make several references to memory being like a silent film. At one time, you say that, you know, the past is like a film I can modify as I please. Now, these aren't just passing references. I think there's a strong cinematic thrust to your style and also a, a kind of cinematic philosophy that seems to inform your vision. How do you, how do you use cinema to talk about your, you know, to, to talk about the past? Yeah. Uh Yes, yes, indeed. This is a very important, uh, I would say essential, indispensable point for my writing, both in poetry and also in narrative, in fiction. Uh, to me, uh, I am a great passionate of film. And the fact that I dedicated to Truffaut, the first, especially the first part of the book, is because Truffaut was very much attentive and sensitive to uh, adolescence and youth, but particularly to adolescence in several of his early films. But in general, uh, filmmaking, a film is an art. Uh, for example, I worked with Federico Fellini, for example, uh, several weeks when he uh, did uh, Casanova, uh, Cinecittà. I was working as an actor in that film in 1975. Uh, so many of you were not yet born, perhaps, perhaps. Anyway, uh, um, cinema and filmmaking has been a, an incredible uh, stimulation for my imagination. I even thought when I was young to become a, a regista, a, a film director. And, and therefore this particular component becomes essential in my writing. Um, recently, a critic that I like, a poet and the critic Giancarlo Pontigia said, uh, I'm quoting him, uh, nella poesia di Luigi Fontanella, la parola è un'immagine, e, e la parola si radica fortemente nell'immagine. I think that this reflection is a very appropriate because indeed is a, a fact that uh, to me, each word very often is associated with an image because the image is faster. The image has a mobility, a motion that only a word in abstract does not have. But if you associate the word with, the, with an image that uh, solicits a certain uh, movement, uh, to me is very productive, is very, um, is very exciting also. So uh, you, you, men you mentioned that in my book, um, L'adolescenza e la notte, the uh, adolescence and night, there is the presence of film, but this is also true in my fiction. For example, in, the, in the, my novel Controfigura, by the way, controfigura is a very cinematic word. Uh, the presence of uh, film making is also very important. So um, in somehow, uh, when you say that there is a strong cinematic uh, trust in my style and also a kind of a cinematic philosophy in my vision, I think these words very, in a very appropriate way can define the essence of my poetry. Can we possibly read that poem that I just mentioned, the, the one with Vertigo? Page yes, the Vertigo is a film, as you all, all know, it's a famous and extremely important film by Alfred Hitchcock. Um, and uh, I don't know how many times I saw that film, but to me it's very fascinating with two incredible actors, Kim Novak and James Stewart. Uh, so the Italian I'm going to read this, uh, this poem, but I would like to ask first, Giorgio, to be read in English, because I, in my experience, I think it works better to read first the English and then the Italian. 
So I, I'm going to ask uh, Giorgio to read slowly the English version, and I will read the Italian. All right, page 61. The music is the same and repeats itself obsessively as in a film. Remember Vertigo? Do you remember that step toward the unknown in love with itself? That suffused shadow from which gushed as if through a veil, a sweet, dreamy, infinite aria. Now that memory accompanies me even as it flees. It says, I don't belong to you. I never belong to you. And how clear and pure are those love struck eyes that roaming and returning to the same balcony. I am 13. I am only 13. I am already 13. Thank you, George. I would like to uh, acknowledge your sensitive and intelligent translation. I would like to say to everybody here that George has done a great work. And I see that Milo De Angelis has joined us. So thank you. Ciao, Milo. La musica è la stessa e si ripete ossessiva come in un film. Ricordi Vertigo? Ricordi quel passo verso l'ignoto, innamorato di se stesso, quell'ombratura soffusa da cui scaturiva, come attraverso un velo, un'aria dolce, trasognata, infinita. Ora quel ricordo mi accompagna, fuggendo. Dice, non ti appartengo, non ti ho mai appartenuto. E sono chiari e tersi quegli occhi innamorati, quel girovagare e ritornare sullo stesso balcone. Ho tredici anni, non ho che tredici anni, ho già tredici anni. So Luigi, I wanted to just make a, a little point here. Uh, I don't belong to you, I never belong to you. These are the words that King Novak says to Jimmy Stewart in the movie, right? Yes. So it might well be that the past itself is talking to you here, right? Yes. Isn't it the past that doesn't belong to you? Uh, okay, this is, a, yeah. this is a crucial point of my poetry. Past is important. And I would like to remind my listeners a very important sentence by William Faulkner. Uh, William Faulkner in a novel titled Requiem for a Non, Requiem per una Suora, he says, the past is never dead. It's not even past. Il passato non è mai morto. Non è nemmeno passato. Ecco, queste parole, questa frase è tratta da Requiem for a Nun di William Faulkner. It's very important because it says to you two things. One, that past is past, so therefore it's not there any longer. And yet, yes, it's there. So there is uh, this sense of appearance and disappearance, of uh, oblivion and transparency in a way. And this is a, a, a stimulation for me uh, uh, in some of my poetry, not, not all my poetry, in some of my poetry to interrogate my past. And this is also in fact the uh, motivation why this book is divided in two parts. Uh, the first part is dedicated to adolescence, adolescenza, which is a theme very important by Truffaut and many poets of the French um, symbolist season. But at, at the same time, uh, it implies also something that is disappearing. Uh, something that is there, but it's not there. It is like uh, 
like when Wall, um, um, Wallace Stevens says, il la poesia è il fagiano che si perde nel folto, no? che si intravede e si perde nel folto. Uh, I remember this line vividly and really defines the sense of poetry that is there, but is not there. So the duty of a poet is to try to capture at least a fragment of that passing reality. And that's, that's more or less what I would like to say to your important uh, question, uh, which is in a way a, a mixture between fantasy and dissolution. Uh, fantasy and dissolution are two themes that can uh, encounter themselves in a contrasting way, but also in a harmonic way, in somehow. Yeah. It, is, uh, it is as if you like to combine a triangle and be happy with this triangle, in a way. Right. Which leads us to a, uh, a little poem of yours that I find very fascinating, um, page 99. Perhaps you would like to read the first English and then I read the Italian. Uh, yes, I will. There we are, all three of us, in a huge bed, the old Anna and you, the new one, next to each other, and I in the middle, in the most perfect harmony. I hold the hands of both in sweet, quiet understanding. There I ponder in my dream. This is how the world should always be, without bitterness. Or envy. Siamo tutti e tre, siamo tutti e tre, in un grande letto. Anna, l'antica, e tu, la presente, una accanto all'altra, ed io nel mezzo, in perfettissima armonia. Stringo la mano ad ambedue. Dolce, silenziosa, la nostra intesa. Ecco, rifletto, sognando, sempre così dovrebbe essere il mondo, senza astio e senza invidia. So the only love triangle that works is the one that's your, in, your, in your imagination, right? One of the elements that's has it. to be imagined, right? Absolutely, that's the uh, supreme exercise of poetry, imagination, yes. It strikes me as almost a courtly love kind of poem, you know, where fulfillment can only be remembered as something that happened in the past or anticipated as something that might happen again in the future, but never in the present. True. Again, the pheasant that disappears nel right. folto, eh? <laughs> nel sottobosco. <laughs> well, but this is the... Uh, in a way is uh, the mm, exercise of poetry between life and death, in a way. And um, the word is indeed the bet between life and death. E la scommessa. Yes, yes. Um, you were talking about, if I, do you have time yes. for a question? I think that the, uh, Alessio would like to say something, no? Alessio? Just don't hear me. No, no. Now I just listen to the dialogue between you two. Ben, it's the end of the conference, maybe. I do some questions. And now, just a moment, to the spectators, if they want, they could ask questions on a Facebook chat, if they want. Allora, se qualcuno vuole intervenire, può farlo um, tranquillamente, insomma, ecco, se c'è qualcuno che vuole Facebook. fare un commento, una, una domanda, non lo so. Uh, io penso che tutto sommato ci possiamo anche fermare qui perché non, non importa la quantità it doesn't count the quantity but the quality of this uh,
connection. Uh, questo è il libro, Adolescence and the Night, Fomite Press, Burlington, Vermont. It's a new publishing house which is very interested in international poetry. I see that in the end there are poets listed. Uh, some of them are very important, like Gonson, Wright, Starbuck, Zog, and many others. And um, so I just hope that you will uh, read the book. The book was published first in, in Italian, as we said, by Passilli, L'Adolescenza e la Notte, and uh, has been translated into French, English, and German. There is an Austrian scholar who is finishing the translation right now. Va bene. Ci fermiamo qui. Grazie a tutti. Grazie a te, Giorgio. Uh, spero di, spero che abbiamo lasciato un segno. Ecco. Ciao a tutti. Ciao, Luigi. Grazie. Grazie a te. No, grazie a te. Grazie a tutti. Ciao, grazie Emma. A te, Luigi. Ciao. Mille. Un abbraccio.